Hey, this is Mike from the One Stop Co-op Shop, and today we're looking at Dark Venture. This is sort of a fantasy slash futuristic slash post-apocalyptic adventure game that was suggested by a commenter in the YouTube channel. But I had actually played a game by the same designer before, but it was an app game, not uh, this board game. We're going to show you how the solo play works. You can also play the game cooperatively or competitively. First, let's show you how setup works. So you're going to take one hero dashboard for each player. And you'll either choose a hero out of all the character cards that say hero on them, or you can randomize one. I just took the first one I came to. You've got some statistics here. Her uh, strength, her agility, her wits or intelligence, and her luck and her health. Characters will tell you their starting items. So she has a tactical vest, a metal shield, and a Torgon's edge, a sword, and any special abilities. In this case, she can steal an item once per game from another character, and she's got a bonus to getting followers to come with her. So that goes in your little holder there. And you can kind of array your items beneath you. And you then mark their starting stats, including any bonuses from items. So the princess has 35 health. You can mark her permanent max health with a black cube and her current health with a red cube. She's got five strength with one bonus from her shield, vest, and sword. Four speed, five mind, and three luck. Additionally, I can mark her combat bonuses up here. So her sword's giving her plus two attack and her vest and shield together give her plus two defense. Now you mark the hour here with this little token on the one space. You're going to have up to 12 rounds to collect quest points. And then you take a token matching each hero and you put it on the quest point track, not yet to the one space, but you'll be getting them pretty quickly. You start with the crossroads location in play. And finally, you get your starting quest. So you shuffle the heroic quests, draw three of them, and pick one you want to take. Here we've got Growing Evil. The Forgone King has heard that the Ovoids are planning to expand their evil empire into his realm, the Dark Grange. The king would like you to send the Egg Empire a message that he hopes will drive them back. For each Ovoid faction character you defeat in combat, gain two quest points, earn six quest points this way to gain a two quest point bonus and discard this card. So up to eight total from that one. Second Wind. You down several flagons of ale at a local tavern. After stumbling out the door, you began your journey home. At least that's where you thought you were headed. After an hour of walking in circles, you realize that you had lost your way. Now the sun is rising, and in your current sleepless state, you feel inspired. You have renewed vigor. Add one quest point to each side quest that you complete. After an additional four quest points are earned this way, gain one bonus quest point, discard this card, then sleep for one complete round, skip one turn. Uh, you will awaken if attacked. Fun. Finally, Arcane Insight. You would like to expand your knowledge of the Arcane. Gain one quest point when your hero enters these locations for the first time. You gain six quest points this way, discard this card. And so let's see, the second win one gives me the most kind of dependable way to gain extra quest points because it's just uh, added on to the side quest you'll see in a second. Whereas this one requires some ovoids to be out and this one requires me to get certain locations. So let's uh, go with second win for now. And then finally, I mentioned side quests. You start with three of them. You've got on guard, engage another hero in combat. That might seem impossible, but even in a one player game, you can still have other heroes. Gain a follower that is a horse or kill a Varpin faction character. Each of those is worth two quest points, or with my current heroic quest, three quest points. And when you play in solo like this, you can either just get as many quest points as possible and compare your progress to a chart, or you can try to get 10 quest points in six turns or 20 quest points in 12 turns. So let's go for 20 quest points here. Finally, we draw our starting hand. There are three decks of cards, uh, locations, characters, and items. We get one location, one character, and two items. So we've got a waterfall pit. Craft the Ancient, another hero, that's good for that one uh, quest I have. A red solar cape, another piece of armor. And a fox bone tincture, which can heal me for 15, not bad. Finally, we have to decide if we're going to play in the A locations or the B locations. The cards don't change, but this will completely change what special powers those locations have, and also what actions and adventures you can have at them. So uh, I played B most recently. Let's switch to A. I like to go back and forth, and that way I don't really remember anything that's going to happen to me. So that's it for setup. We're ready to have our adventure. Let's see how the game is played. So as I already mentioned in setup, the game is played over either 6 or 12 rounds. We're going to play a 12-round game here. At the beginning of each round, each hero gets 3 action points to spend for the round. They additionally heal 2 hit points if they're below their max. We aren't, of course. They get to draw a card of the type of their choice, so either a location, a character, or an item. And since I have a side quest to kill a Varpin and a side quest to gain a follower that's a horse, both of which are characters, I'm going to draw an extra character card. And I got Wester the Bold, another hero who is neither a horse uh, nor a Varpin, so not helping me yet. Now you can only have five cards in your hands. So in order to draw another card, if I already had five at the beginning of a turn, I would have to throw away an item specifically. I could not draw a card if I already had five cards in my hand that were just characters or locations. You have to always throw away an item. Okay, finally, I can either draw a side quest if I'm not at the max of three cards 
cards, or I can get rid of one to redraw a new one. And I think I'm less likely to get a horse specifically. Those are pretty rare, so I'm going to get rid of that one. Instead, this isn't the last you'll see of me. Have your hero become unconscious. Well, hey, this is a win-win situation. If I fight uh, one of those heroes I drew, I can either win and get two quest points or lose and get uh, one quest point. Now, on your first turn, you start at the crossroads, and you can do a bunch of stuff with your actions. Your first option is to play a location, but you have to have the paths meet up from your current location. And you can rotate it however you like to make that work out. And when you do that, you immediately read the entry in your chosen location guide for your number. And then if you generally move into that location, you'll get to have an action if they have a green number there. Second action you can play is to play a character, like one of the two heroes I have. They have to be on a location adjacent to you, so you can't play them on your own space. And they'll immediately gain from the item deck, if those cards aren't already in your hand, the indicated items there. So they'll kind of be loaded up. And you can actually play people that way to try to kill them and take their stuff or even trade with them if you want to. As for items, you can freely play them from your hand into your inventory. You can have a max of eight cards in your inventory overall. But it does take one of your action points to actually equip something. So if I wanted to put this cape on and take off my tactical vest, that would take one action point. You can move for one action point. You can fight somebody for one action point. Although if they're aggressive, none of these heroes are, they'll attack you automatically for free. You can also pick up an item on your location. And finally, you can roll against mine to search a location and get an item there. But each location gets marked when you do that and can only be searched once per game. When you actually have to do something like fight someone, you'll roll some dice and add the indicated statistic. And you'll have a target number to reach or exceed. So those are the basics of the game. I'm racing to get 20 quest points before I reach the end of round 12. At the Meridian, round 6, I get a new heroic quest, picking out of two cards. I can also, once per game, spend an action to trade in all three of my current side quests for a heroic quest. Now when we get to combat, we'll see how that works, but that's pretty much the core gameplay. So let's get into it. Uh, in this case, I do think I want to play the Waterfall Pit and then try to go fight one of the heroes to start working on that quest. And let's just make it right side up for now. So I immediately read entry 24. Further down the road, you can see a small hill covered in grass and what looks like a clearing. You hear the sound of wildly rushing water, but there's no running water in sight. So the sound seems out of place. A sword clanks against rock in the distance. Then you hear the echo of an otherworldly howl. When a player's hero or follower enters his location, read action 56. So now that's interesting. I was going to use my next action to play one of the heroes in my hand down there to fight for my quest. But based on my description, I think I'll probably encounter someone here anyway. So let's uh, spend my second action to go here and save myself the trouble. So I immediately read 56 before I spend my third action. You walk into the field towards the sound of rushing water and almost step into a gaping hole in the ground. It was hidden from view, obstructed by a low hill. A beam of sunlight illuminates what looks like an underground river below. It's very dark down there, but you catch a glimpse of a shining object below. Then you notice a shadow dart through the light. If someone has already done so, you may jump down into the pit or inspect the pit. Hmm, well, again, I want to fight, so I'm going to inspect the pit and see if I can find where that shadow is. So this is a free. It would indicate if it costs an action point, and I'll go to 62. Deep in the sinkhole, there's a wildly rushing river. The river flows into a waterfall that drops deeper into the hole than you can see. As you carefully walk the circumference of the pit, you discover a ladder leading down to the shore of the river. If someone has already done so, you may climb down the ladder, or you may freely leave this location. Okay, well, I'll try climbing down. You climb down the ladder onto the riverbank below. There's a shiny object half buried here. Draw one item card. Again, you hear the sharp clang of a sword striking stone. You're getting closer to the source. Read action 64. Well, let's see what our item is first. Golden bow. A weaker attack than what I have now. For one AP, hit a character in an adjacent location for 2d6 damage. Roll 1d6 plus luck. If six or less, they move onto your location and attack you. And once per battle, roll 1d6 plus speed. If 10 or higher after taking a battle turn, take a second battle turn. That's pretty good. But for now, let's continue our little excursion. You turn and then instantly freeze in place. Draw the Grathorn, then shuffle. If it's in hand, reveal it, then place it here. If it's already been played, read action 65. About 20 paces from where you stand, there's a hulking creature. It wavers as it rises, looking away from you, seemingly staring at the pit wall. Suddenly, it throws itself headfirst into a metallic mineral deposit. This is the clanging noise you heard earlier. The beast ravenously consumes pieces of ore that fall to the ground. It has not seen you yet, but it soon will. At the beginning of your next turn, it will stop feeding and attack everyone in this location. You may use the nearby ladder to easily escape the pit, then move to another location as usual. So I find the Grathorn. Oh my gosh. So he's not a hero, which means he wouldn't work for my quest. He's got 46 life, uh, 8 power, which is used for attacking, no equipment. 
When attacks roll 1d6, if 4 or higher, increase the damage it deals by the number rolled. Damage it inflicts ignores your armor bonus. Damage from swords reduced by 4. This guy is a monster. So they have uh, little tokens for each guy. And uh, let's put his card as far away as possible because I'll never plan to fight him. And yeah, I'll definitely use my last action to sneak out while they're giving me the chance because no, sir, I don't want to fight you. Now I'm at five cards and I don't have to discard any, so I will for free put down the foxbone tincture and the golden bow. I'm not sure about the armor. All right, so our first little adventure ends in horror and no quest points for me yet. Let's move on to round two. Let's go to draw a card. I have heroes I can fight for my quest, but I don't have any locations to put them on. So let's draw a new location. Barnard's Grave. Okay, just a location number this time. No uh, special action like monsters appearing to kill me, so that should work. And let's see. I don't want to become unconscious. I don't want to lose, so let's get rid of that one. Trade it for come and get me. Use a bow to hit a character on an adjacent location. Oh, well, that's perfect since I got the golden bow. Yeah, so this makes the scope of my turn pretty clear. I've got uh, Wester the Bold, who's an archer. And look, he has the golden bow. Oh, man, or the U bow. I was going to say, if I already had the golden bow equipped, then when I played him, I wouldn't have to give him any weapon at all. That means he'll get the U bow instead of me, which is fine. I'll definitely be shooting him with an arrow first. So let's uh, place Barnard's grave there and read entry 20. That's my first action. There's a flash of blinding white light. All players roll 3d6 plus luck. The hero of the player with the lowest roll is instantly teleported to this location at no AP costs. This player may then draw an item card or take any card from the discarded item pile and add it to their hand. Well, I guess it's going to be me since there are no other players. That's okay. I'll just put the hero over here instead. Free item. The Phantom Blade. Uh, cool. I mean, yeah. It's not really any better than the sword I already have. So for my next action, I will play Wester the Bold. Get him out. I'll put him back on the crossroads where I just left. He just wanders over. And he's going to have a U-Bow and a Cryptic Map. He can add to his first strike, and he has Portal Expert, which shouldn't come into play. Yeah, the U-Bow looks pretty much the same as the other bow, and uh, the map would be a nice little bonus for me to steal from him. So we just kind of keep all of this together, and they do have little boards to put together when you're actually fighting, so I'll probably use that in a second. For my final action, I think I'll replace both my Sword and Shield with the Golden Bow. Because that is two hands. You can only have two hands of holding at one time. So the uh, sword and the shield were filling that up before. That's going to be a plus one speed bonus, plus two mind bonus. So we can bump those right up. But it does take my attack and defense bonuses down one, so that's not great. All right, a few slow turns, but I'm ready to do some stuff next turn. We're going into round three. All right, so I've got those pretty much covered. Let's see if I draw a Varpin, and if I don't, I can uh, get a replacement side quest. So we'll go and draw another character. Argal the Warlord. By the way, they show the factions. Ah, he is a Varpin. Although he's a terrifyingly powerful Varpin, so I don't know if that helps me much. He holds Torgon's Edge, which I have, or the Farm Blade and a Metal Shield. Defeated, he becomes unconscious. I mean, he might wake up again. Um, oh, and he can heal a whole bunch. And he's got way more life than me, and he attacks harder than I do. Yeah, not sure if I'll be killing him. So even though I got the exact card I wanted, let's switch it out. Nice weight, maybe. Equip a new shield to keep it equipped for two game rounds. Oh, okay. So, uh, I mean, I don't know if my shield is a new shield, but I think if I equip it, that'll uh, qualify. But first, let's shoot an arrow at this guy and see how that goes. So we'll mark his uh, main statistics here, which is his speed, his power, his uh, attack bonus, and his health. We shouldn't need the rest. So the golden bow says, for one action point, hit a character in an adjacent location for 2d6 damage. That's just automatic. And then roll 1d6 plus my luck. If six or less, I move into your location and attack you. So for my second action, I'll make like Legolas and shoot this bad boy. Not bad, eight damage. My luck is three, and that is a one, so he's definitely charging in. All right, so they're attacking me. And before we get to whether I die or not, uh, I'm engaged with another hero in combat. So that's two plus one from second win, my heroic quest. Three, and come get me, so that's a one plus one. So that's five quest points overall. Woohoo, I'm on the board. I'm going to mark second win with two tokens to show I'm halfway to gaining the bonus quest points and then sleeping for a whole round. All right, so here's how combat works. It's pretty simple. First, we do a first strike check to see who gets to attack first. So we each roll 2d6, add our speed, plus any bonuses. So I've got 5 speed plus uh, 6, so that's 11. He's got 6 speed. 
plus six, so that's 12. Now he does a special ability that might have let him get an extra one bonus, but he didn't need it. So when someone attacks, they roll 2d6 plus their power plus their combat bonus minus the armor defense, and that's how much damage they deal. So you tend to do a lot of damage because armor never gets very high. So he's doing a five, that's a good first roll. Uh, plus three and four, so that's nine damage, minus one, eight to me. So down to 27, one below him, but now I get to respond. Come on, big number. Okay, seven. And I forgot my power went down from unequipping my stuff. So that's a seven plus three plus one, so that's 11. He has no armor, so he's down to 17. Uh, looking decent. If I can roll better than him again. His second attack, you just keep on going until one of you wants to flee. Eight. So 8 plus 4 minus 1 is 11. I'm down to 16. I should be able to survive at least one more hit. Come on, big money. Oof. So 4 plus uh, 4 more. That's 8. So he's down to 9. If I don't roll that terribly again, I should get him. All right, a third attack. Hopefully his last one. Oh, my God. I think it'll be somebody's last attack. That's 12 plus 4 is 16 minus 1 armor. Wow. That got me to one life. <laughs> I, mean, I should have kept that quest and left me, I guess, for being knocked out. Come on, finish him off. Ah, there we go. Okay, so 9 plus all my bonuses. Definitely more than enough to defeat him, but I am going to be resting for a while. So West for the Bold is discarded. Uh, his U-Bow and his cryptic map are on his space. I can pick them up for one action point each to uh, make them mine. And you just mark that by turning over their items. And we got one action point left. You know, I think I will pick up the cryptic map. It lets me draw three locations, pick one, shuffle the rest back, place the location for no cost, and then you can move there for no cost. So it kind of costs me one to pick it up, but saves me two actions later. As for the Ubo, I can't imagine I'll ever need it, so I'm just going to put it in the discard pile instead of worrying about keeping this guy's corpse around. I got a decent amount of quest points there. I'm going up to round four. And I do gain two hit points at the beginning of every round, remember? Let's see, I want to equip my shield again this round, and then I can keep it around to get some quest points that way. I get to draw a new quest card. Roll to try to wear egg armor. This will help me fit in. <laughs> uh, so to find egg armor, I have to either dig in the item deck for it or fight an Eggman for it. Let's see, I guess I'll draw an item because I'm about to use the map to get a location for free. I don't need more characters right now. Oh my gosh, that was unlikely. So let's see, what does happen when I try to wear this stuff? The spikes on the inside of this armor make it difficult to put on. When characters that are not the Ovoid faction choose to equip this item, roll 2d6. If a 2d7, the character takes 2 damage and rolls again. If 8 through 12, the armor is equipped. Okay, so I can definitely make that happen. I just want to wait till I have more health in case I miss the roll several times. You know, instead of waiting, I could drink my Foxbone Tincture. So it costs one action point to drink it. I'll heal 15, and then I roll, and if I get a 3 to 6, I get my action point back. So let's definitely do that for my first action. So it takes me all the way back up to 18. Certainly ready to get stabbed by some egg armor. If I'm lucky, it won't cost me. Hey, there we go. Got my action point back. So for another action, I'm going to try to equip this egg armor. Place my tactical vest, since it does have better defense. I need to get an 8 or above. Okay, so that's 2 damage. Seven, four damage. There we go. So back down to 14. The egg armor gives me two defense. There's the same plus one power. And I gain plus one luck, but lose a plus one mind from the tactical vest. And hey, I completed my side quest, and I'll get a plus one quest point for my second wind. That brings me to seven total. And for my next two actions, let's unequip the golden bow, and in its place, get my... Torgon's Edge, and my Metal Shield back, especially for the uh, side quest with the Metal Shield. Let's see, quite a few changes. I lose one speed and two mine from the bow. My attack bonus is up to two. My armor bonus is all the way up to three. I've got five power overall. Yeah, so not bad. Definitely tougher than I was to start. But that was my entire turn, so let's go to round five. I mark that I kept my shield equipped for one round. And yeah, I have no side quests right now, so I guess I'll just draw a location. I got Bill Kids. Pond. Okay, a little nice rowboat there. There was an action associated with it. I also get a new side quest to go with my shield one. Get out and do something. Enter three different locations that have hex actions to gain two quest points. All right, now the only play location that does is the death location, so I'm not sure I'll begin to that one. All right, so I do have my map, but I don't need to play it yet. Let's play uh, Bill Kid's Pond instead. Oh, I made a little circle. That's nice. 
Let's see, there's a deep burbling moan that echoes from up the road. You see a pond ahead that appears to have a small wooden dock and might have a boat moored to it. Nearby, there's a large sign that has a colorful trail map posted onto it. The player's hero or follower enters the location. Read action 39. Well, I guess that would get me closer to getting that quest, so let's move in here for my second action. By the pond, there's a map posted that was partially destroyed and a small wooden boat floating near the dock. For 1 AP, if someone has an already a hero or weapon-wielding follower who enters this location can read the map, destroy the map, get in the boat, or untie the boat. Because I'm guessing that getting in the boat wouldn't help much unless I untied it first. There's not really anywhere to go. So let's uh, spend my last action to read the map, and then we'll uh, get a new heroic quest next round, so that might help me with something more to do. Your current location on the posted map is marked by an arrow labeled You Are Here. Sections of the map are unreadable, but you can make out directions of various nearby locations that look interesting. Draw one location card into your hand, if possible, discarding an item or character from your hand if necessary. Once per turn, for one action point, two more location cards can be drawn this way by any player with a hero or weapon holding follower in this location. Right, so I get a location card, cool. In this case it is the Loner's Cavern. Oh, another one with a hex, so if I can get over there, maybe now uh, making a circle was not such a good idea. That'll give me another point towards that one side quest. But first, an important moment, specifically because I only have seven quest points out of 20, I'm going to get two new heroic quests and choose one. Okay, find revenge. I gotta draw until I get a hero, two game rounds later, kill them, I'm not sure about that. Okay, tax collector, I'm gonna find the diamond mine, put the dirt twins there, and try to get items from them. Ah, oh, man. I've seen the dirt twins before, and they are very nasty. So I guess I'll try to get revenge from the hero, good luck. So here is Haglor the Ghostly. Too strong. So the Ghost Sword and the Dimension Jewel. Let's see, his ability is an optional one that would let him run away, so I don't think he would ever use that in solo. And I forgot, in solo you don't use the Dimension Jewel because it's only for uh, multiplayer games. So he's going to have a Crystal Helm instead. So I've got a bit of an idea here. I haven't used my once per game ability yet. So what if when he pops up, I steal his Ghost Sword. That'll take away three of his potential damage. And he has uh, eight more health while he has it equipped. And that should make him much more uh, manageable to defeat. He's not showing up for two rounds. And I think I did forget to gain my plus two health. So I think I'm up to 18 now. Let's see, I have enough locations. Oh, actually, I've got five of each card type. Sure, but I'm going to draw an item and try to get like something that can heal me, and I'll throw away the Phantom Blade. And I got another sword. That's not going to help. Oh, but don't forget, I've got uh, two side quests. The shield one's almost done. I need to get two more for this one, then I'll finish up Second Wind. My new one. Completely failure here is inventory with eight items. That should be easy. I guess I've already got six. And yeah, I can just put things in my inventory for free, so let's do this with both of them and finish the quest immediately. So that gets me one quest point, plus one from Second Wind. So take me to nine. It does mean then that I skip this entire round, so we're just going to go right to uh, round seven, I guess. So we'll run round from our hero friend entering. We do heal up a bit more, which is good. I think for cards, I'll, uh, I guess, draw another item. Well, you know, I could get a follower. She's good at getting followers. Nope, just a monster. But hey, I do finish up my shield, so I gain two more quest points. Brings me to 11, but hey, if I defeat this hero, that'll get me to 17 all by itself. And I'm almost done with that side quest. Let's see what else I get. Pick up an item dropped by a character that you don't control. I mean, technically that Yubo is still over here, so maybe I should do that. It's one quest point, why not? Let's see, for my first action, I'll go here. For my second action, I'll pick up the Yubo, although I can't actually carry it, so I'll just throw it away immediately. I think I'm allowed to do that, I guess. That gets me to 12. For my third action, working toward that other side quest, let's play the Loner's Caverns, which is going to be up there. That's location 9, even though you can't see it. There's a strange, calming light that emanates from deep within this cavern. When a player is here or a follower enters its location, read 23. All right, so I'll be set to uh, do that next turn and get closer to getting my next side quest. Our hero's about to pop up. We're at 8. Healing the 22. All right, we get to place Hagler the Ghostly on an empty location. I guess I want him over there. And for now, he's got a crystal helm and a ghost sword, but again, I'm going to uh, invoke my royal privilege and steal that in a second. But for my card draw, I think I'll get an item to try to heal. Ooh, blade staff. Uh, it does more damage, but it would take away my shield's defense, so nah. I do get a new side quest. Play a location card. Oh, darn it, I could have done that a second ago. Uh, all right, we'll get to that. So for my first action, I'll run in here. Let's see what action 23 does. The first hero or follower to enter the cavern unwittingly walks through an arcane rift. Doesn't sound good. You may draw an additional heroic quest and may draw or replace a side quest. Also, if any hero or follower is alone at this location, their player may roll 1d6 plus luck for 1 AP. 
If the roll total is nine or more, you may heal them for 10 health. All right, uh, so I can draw an additional hero quest and draw or replace a side quest. Why not? Give me more options. The Roar Gone Cruel. Recently, a nearby village was attacked and destroyed. All the inhabitants of the village were killed. People are saying that a heinous beast, mistakenly summoned by an evil sect of warlocks, is to blame. The creature has been named Roar Gone Cruel, meaning vile butcher. If you kill it, gain nine. This guy, I've seen him, he's horrific. So, nope. But how do you get another side quest? Equip a jewel and keep it equipped for two game rounds. I've not found one of those yet. Well, that's my second get out and do something, so that's good. All right, so now the question is, do I attack this guy? He's got more life than me, but I've got better attack and defense. Ah, let's go for it. All right, so first of all, I'm gonna use my royal privilege and take his ghost sword, and I'll just throw it away, I guess. And then for my actual second action, I'm gonna fight the guy. All right, you jerk, you killed my friend, and now you're gonna die. He's got 34 life without his sword. He's got a four strength total, one defense, and just for that initial first strike, he's got three speed. All right, so let's see who attacks first. I've got four speed plus 10, 14, yes. He's got three plus nine, 12, got him. And I have a five power plus two attack bonus, so that'll be seven minus his armor, so I'll add six to whatever I roll. And he's got just four minus three. So he'll add one to whatever he rolls. So gosh, I hope I can kill him. All right, so I got eight plus six, so that's 14 damage. He's down to 20, not bad. And he's got a nine plus just one is 10 damage. So I'm down to 12. It's not great, but we can survive. Okay, second attack for me. Oh gosh, four. Four plus six is 10. Okay, so you only got 10 left, even if I roll terribly. Okay, don't roll too good, don't roll too good. Oh, nice. So four plus one is only five. I'm down to six life. Okay, once again, I need to kill. I need to kill, let's go. Ooh, seven plus six, 13, more than enough, got him. Okay, so Haglor is dead, leaving the stuff behind. That does mean that I have found revenge for my friend, a local village elder, six quest points. All right, all right. I just gotta get two more quest points. So I have one action left. I think I just wanna go somewhere where I can play my map to get another location with a hex and that'll be enough to help me win. So let's move on down for my last action. So we go to round nine. I heal two life, thank you. I guess I'll get rid of my jewel side quest. Trade one item, I don't think that'll happen, but that's okay, I don't need it if I can just get another hex location. Should draw another card, I guess I'll get a location as well, just make sure I get what I need. Okay, that one has a hex, so there we go. So action one. Action two, let's play this. Oh, oh, I can't fit it. Okay, let's use our map instead. It's one action to use the map, but I get to place the location for free, drawn out of three locations, and then I can move there for free. Let's pick the one that seems the least likely to kill me. Okay, I got Precipice Lighthouse, Gargan's Clearing, or Darwin's Fork, and they all have hex uh, actions. The Lighthouse is probably the least likely to have me immediately get attacked. Like maybe it'll say, hey, do you want to open the door? And I can just say no. Will it fit? Yes. All right, so I read its entry. There's a shadowy figure looking outside this lighthouse tower. Come on. You will have to move closer to see who it is. All right, well, let's try it. So it's a free action. I have one left to hopefully run away. Draw until a weapon holding character is found. Equip them and place them into this location. Draw one item and place them in their inventory. If the drawn character is not aggressive, they shout to the character in this location, I'm the keeper of this lighthouse. May I be of service to you? Any player controlled here or a follower may be granted access to the lighthouse where from the top they may glimpse a distant location. Uh, okay. So the important thing here is, are they aggressive and will they try to kill me? The first character drawn is an elite Eggman warrior, but luckily he does not have a weapon. It's a weapon wielding, so he goes away. Arrow the horse, no. Orpa wanderer, no. Draken, no. Oh man, he could have been a follower. Ah, oh, there we go. Dane the Dirt Twin. Okay, he's not aggressive, so that's fine. You're a little dirty man guarding the lighthouse. And yes, I certainly don't need to look at your lighthouse, but I do need to score two quest points for getting out and doing something. So there we go, my journey is complete. Now again, I could have played just to see how far I could get and how many quest points I could earn, but I think I showed you the uh, basics of the game and a lot of the fun is exploring locations for yourself, so I'm gonna spoil too many more. So Princess Bretta wanders back to the crossroads. Uh, did she enjoy her jaunt out of the castle for the day? Well, she murdered a couple people, uh, got some painful spiky armor on her body. I think that sounds like a good day out to me. So that was Dark Venture. Hope you enjoyed it. Good gaming, and we'll see you at the next stop.